Let's have a word of prayer first. Lord, we ask for your blessing upon us as we come and uh, look into the account of the life of Paul. Uh, we are thankful to you, Lord, for bringing us into the year 2022. And it is all by your grace and mercy you have brought us into this new year. Lord, may you give us your grace to go through this year and help us and guide us to grow spiritually strong in you, in our faith in you, in our commitment and dedication to you. Bless our time, Lord, even as we recall the life of the Apostle Paul and how he came to know you and how he went into the missionary journeys. May you encourage our hearts, may you challenge us, and may you help us, Lord, to be uh, imitators of Paul also in his commitment and dedication to our Savior Jesus Christ. May we also be committed and dedicated to you. So bless our time together now, Lord, and cleanse our hearts from all our sins. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, praise the Lord for the opportunity to share with you God's word from the life of the Apostle Paul. I've been a pastor for over 40 years in Grace Bible Presbyterian Church. I came to know the Lord in 1967, and I'm now 71 years old, actually. And this is all by the grace of God. I've been in the mission field for many years also, and I've been with Reverend Go Sing Fong for a long time, except that I've not gone to some of the places that I see some of you, like Nepal. You know, I've been to Myanmar and so forth, the Philippines and that kind of things. I've been involved in missions for a long time also, so praise the Lord for the opportunity to uh, do the work of the Lord and serve the Lord also. Uh, well, I've studied actually in the uh, Far Eastern Bible College and I did my diploma and then after that my bachelor's. After which later on, in, uh, years later, I went to the, U the, the States to do my Master of Arts. Praise the Lord for that, for grace to finish the Master of Arts. And then I finally took the strength and the, the grace from God with the encouragement from Reverend Go that, you know, I went on to do my uh, demean studies and I completed the demean also. So thank God for that. So this is all of God's grace. Uh, I mean, we do all these things for the furtherance of God's kingdom. So praise the Lord for the opportunity to do his work and, and serve him also. Now, I'm going to share with you three, uh, the uh, first part on the life of Paul, on how he came to know the Lord and, you know, people like Barnabas coming, coming into his life and so forth, how he wanted to persecute the Christians, that kind of things. And then after that, I'm going to talk about the first missionary journey of Paul, then second missionary journey, and then the third missionary journey of Paul. Hopefully, I can show you some things from Israel also. I've been to Israel nine times, and because I normally go with Jerusalem University uh, uh, College, and that's the, the group that I always go with. And I bring the Singapore team with me also to go and study uh, under uh, Dr. Jack Beck in, uh, in, the, in, in Jerusalem. And uh, we, we have got a fantastic uh, time of ministry also in Israel. So praise God for that. Now let's look into the life of the Apostle Paul first and we will begin with his, uh, his early years. Huh? And this is the background to the uh, way in which he came to know the Lord and we'll begin with Paul. Just take a look here and we will see Paul whose Jewish name was Saul was an arch enemy of Christianity who amazingly became the greatest Christian missionary of all times. And really, it is really wonderful to be able to see this man. His life is tremendously transformed. Actually, I use the word revolutionize. His life was really turned upside down for Jesus Christ. Uh, what you, you want to use, you know, right side up, you know, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So thank God for the way the Lord used uh, people like him. Uh, Paul, you know, to uh, encourage the, the lives of many uh, Christians also. And then he authored more books of the Bible than anyone else. And he's called the Apostle to the Gentiles. I'm just going to just mention something at this point here. Paul, the Greek word, the Greek name for Paul is, we all know is Paulus. So if you have been a 
Christian for many years and you have studied the, 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 the Bible and so forth, you come across this word Paulos. And that means little in Latin, all right? And uh, Paul was also known as Saul and he wore both names. He actually had both names, Paul and Saul. Let me just give you, I'm reading from the, the English Standard Version. Uh, usually I, I use ESV now for my reading. And I'm going to read from uh, Acts chapter 13 and verse 9. Acts chapter 13, let me see. Uh, Acts chapter 13 and verse 9. But Saul, who was also called Paul. See that? His name is there. You, you want to take note of that. He has both names there. Saul, he was also called Paul. Let me just, okay. Somebody was coming in. That, that's the name of the Apostle Paul. Eh? He, Paul and then, of course, Saul. In Acts chapter 13 and verse 9, you, you want to take note of, of that. And the Gentiles call him Paul, but the Jews call him Saul. And we see that he was an arch enemy of Christianity. <laughs> this, this guy is really a persecutor of the Christians. And he went all out to persecute the Christians, isn't it? But then he was the greatest Christian missionary of all time. I think if you uh, think about a great missionary today in the 20th century or the 21st century, I, I'm sure you can find people. But when you look into the Bible, you can find none other than the Apostle Paul himself or Saul himself. All right. And the transformation of Paul was just amazing. His conversion. And this speaks of the power of the gospel to transform the life of people. So let's, let's not take uh, the, the, the gospel lightly. Eh? If, when we give the gospel to people, uh, you know, to people that we think cannot come to Christ, will not come to Christ, do not want to come to Christ, that somehow the word of God will touch their hearts and, and really transform their lives. And so let us just go forth and just share the word of God. And it is a task of the Holy Spirit to convict and to convert the hearts of these people and transform them and change them. I know of guy in my in my church many years ago. He was he was a a, a gambler. He goes to play a, a racehorse every Saturday. Well, one day he came to know Jesus Christ, and I tell you, he 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 told me that you know he he testified to me one day. He says the day I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, my life was changed because the following week uh, I didn't go to to play horse anymore, you know. I didn't go and gamble anymore. I don't do those things anymore. It, it is a transformation, trans, transforming power of the, the lives of, of people uh, who have been touched by the gospel. And here was Paul, became the greatest Christian missionary of all times. And that's where you can quote 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, isn't it? And says that, you know, every man who is in Christ is a new creature, a new creation in Christ. He authored more books in the Bible than anyone. Of course, we all know the book of Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians, uh, the Thessalonians, the, the, the book of Timothy, and, and so on and so forth, right? And he was also apostle to the Gentiles. That's right, apostle to the Gentiles. He reaches out to the non-Jews. Just tremendous. And that's a tough work for him. Paul, Paul was a Jew himself, and then, but he, he reaches out to the Gentiles. That's amazing. And so when we think of ourselves, you know, if God changed our lives uh, and transform us in our lives, he can really use us in different ways, you know. So let's, let's not, uh, you know, uh, limit God in, in using us for the furtherance of his kingdom. He can, he can use us in ways that, you know, you, you look at ourself, yourself and you say, this is tremendous, it's impossible. God can use this kind of people for his purpose and for his glory. <clears throat> Now, let, let me just mention something about this word apostle. I just This is all quite a basic things for all of us to take note of. But I want us to take note of the, this particular word apostle. He was the apostle to the Gentile. The first group of uh, is designated apostles, which means those who were sent forth with a commission. And this group of apostles is known as the 12 disciples. All right. 12 apostles are the 12. And then, of course, after Judas betrayed Jesus, Matthias was chosen to replace Judas. And that's found in the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 15 down to 26. And the person who replaced Judas 
had been, uh, he had been with Jesus. And what happened is that from, from his baptism until his ascension up to heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, right? We see that the person who replaced Judas had, had been with Jesus and he had seen Jesus and so forth. And so we see that the word apostle would come to have a broader use, all right? And the broader use is that, you know, some people like to say that, you know, the apostles have meaning. Uh, uh, the, the understanding is that here is a person who is really doing the work of missions, just like Paul who does the work of missions and so forth. Well, true, you can use that understanding also. But we will want to see that an apostle is one who has seen the Lord and has that personal relationship with the Lord. More importantly, this guy was transformed by the Lord because he has seen the Lord Jesus Christ and God has changed his life tremendously. All right. Of course, we ask ourselves this question today. Are there apostles today? I, I think that's a challenging question, isn't it, for some people? But I personally don't think there is apostles today anymore. Uh, there, are, there are people uh, who call themselves apostles and so forth. But, well, I don't think there is any more apostles other than Jesus himself. But let's go into the second uh, part down here. Paul was a Jew from the tribe of Benjamin and a Roman citizen. Then you also take note that he came from a well-respected family in Tarsus of Cilicia, which is Turkey. And then you see the, the circle down there in a the map. That's the one, Tarsus. And that would be Turkey, where his father was an official. Paul was a Jew. There are a couple of things that I want you to take note down here, and that is found in the book of Acts chapter uh, 22, verses 1 to 3, right? And the Bible tells us that the Apostle Paul was a Jew. And let me read for you down here. I think it's good for us to read the Word of God and to understand the Word of God down here, right? What I am saying is what the Bible says, and that's important. And so Paul was a Jew. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia. I am a Jew. All right. And then it is told in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5, he was of the tribe of Benjamin. And so I will go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin. So this is God's precious word that tells us so. He was a Roman citizen going back to the book of Acts chapter 22 again and then we see all the way to verse 27 and also to 28. Verse 27 says, tell me are you a Roman citizen? And Paul says, yes, I am a Roman citizen. So we see this man, right? A Jew, Roman citizen, and from the tribe of Benjamin. And he came from a well-respected family in Tarsus, right? In Turkey. I've never been to this part of the world. I've been to Turkey. I brought uh, the mission. I, I brought the, the, the tour groups to Turkey also. And we went to see the seven churches of Asia and so forth. It's an amazing thing. If you ever go to Turkey, visit Ephesus, all right? That's a fantastic place to visit Ephesus. But he came from a well-respected family in Tarsus. And this is told to us in uh, Acts chapter 22 and verse uh, 3, right? I'm a Jew born in Tarsus, brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Right, we'll talk about this man later on. He was from this particular place, he was a highly educated person. I think when we look into the life of Paul, we can see this tremendous thing in his life. He was an educated person, and how the Lord just transformed his, his life. Now, I just want to make it very clear it, it doesn't mean that you know you're not. You're an educated person, therefore, you know, you can then be used in the, in the ministry. It's not so. I think God can use all sorts of people. God uses different 
aspect of people in their life. And so uh, we cannot say God only uses the educated. God also uses those who are lowly in, in society also. Transform their life, change their life, and they have been used by the Lord also. All right, so let's move on to see the next one here. Let me see. Let me see down here. Let, I think. Okay. Let me see down here. Right. He excelled in his studies and became a devout Pharisee. There, as a young man, he was sent to Jerusalem to study under the great teacher Gamaliel in the book of Acts chapter 22 and verse uh, 25. I just want to mention something about this man, uh, Gamaliel, and also the aspect of the Pharisee. Paul was a Pharisee. In the book of Acts chapter 23 and verse 6, he mentions down here. Let me just uh, read for you this verse here, all right? I'll read for you. Uh, when Paul perceived that one of the parts was Sadducee and the other Pharisee, he cried out in the council. And in verse 6 of Acts chapter 23, he says, I am a Pharisee. Uh, very clear from the Bible itself. I am a Pharisee. And then you can read for yourself in Acts chapter 26 and verse 5. Uh, Philippians chapter 3, the verse 5, uh, and also other account. Now, this time concerning Gamaliel, Acts chapter 22, verse 3, and also in Acts chapter uh, 5 and verse 34. Let me just read for you here in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3. Let me just get a verse. Huh? Okay. It is mentioned in Acts chapter 22 and verse 3. He mentions down here, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Now, just let me mention something about a Pharisee here. Pharisee speaks of a man or a, or a, or a group of people who actually is they, they are consider themselves as a separate people, you know, uh, a holy group of people, a sanctified kind of people, all right, a separate person. You can see this in the book of Acts chapter 23 and verse 3. Josephus said the Pharisees were the most accurate interpreters of the law. Josephus said that, you know, and hold the position of the leading sect. The Pharisees are very important people. And then, of course, you have the Pharisees, you have the Sadducees, and there are other sects, isn't it? The Essenes and so forth. Paul was with this most influential sect of the Jewish religion, the, the, the Pharisees. And he even called this group the strictest party of our religion. You can read that in the book of Acts chapter 26 and verse 5. I, I just show you these Bible verses here huh? so that we can all understand from God's here, God's word down here. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 5. They have known for a long time if they are willing to testify that according to the strictest party of our, of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. See that? So this party is so, so strict in the, in the rules and so forth. Right? One of the rules I, I, I remember reading was this, you know. Pharisees has got lots and lots of rules. And the, the thing is, one of them have to do with if, if the chicken lay eggs on a Sunday, uh, on the Sabbath day, they allow the chicken to lay eggs, you know. But the next day, uh, the chicken... The, 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 the hen uh, will have to die, will have to be, to be killed. Well, that's, that's the Pharisee, the way in which they, they go about to uh, make sure that these people stick to the rules of, of what the Bible teaches or their law teaches, right? Then take note also of this man by the name of Gamaliel. Gamaliel is uh, another great man, doctor of law, member of the Sanhedrin. And we all know that the Sanhedrin is a ruling body, which is uh, which one the highest uh, ruling body in, in the Jewish uh, group. And the, the particular group, the, the Sanhedrin, consists of 71 members. You know? And there is the high priest, 
that will be the main person who will take care of all of them, right? But these people do not have the power to condemn people to death. They don't have the power to do that at all. But I also want you to see, they represent the liberal wing of the Pharisees. That's the Sanhedrin. And uh, we also see in the book of Acts chapter 5, verses 33 to 34, he intervened with a reason and persuasive speech at the trial of the apostle Gamaliel. Gamaliel was the one who came into the picture and he was the one who was able to speak for Paul and for others and so forth. And Paul acknowledged him as his teacher in second in, in the book of Acts 22 and verse 3. There is a word that is used, designated Rabban, R-A-B-B-A-N, Rabban. Our teacher, that's a highest title than the word Rabbi. Rabban, R-A-B-B-A-N. Rabban means this guy is such a prestigious teacher. He is such a high uh, level teacher in uh in, in, in that, that part of the world uh, or in the society itself. All right. So take note of this man. As a young man, he was sent to Jerusalem and to study under the great teacher, Gamaliel. Let me just uh, see whether I can show you some things down here. Um, yeah, that's a picture of Jerusalem. You want to take note of this beautiful picture. This is a be beautiful picture of Jerusalem, which I took uh, when I was there some time ago. And I actually put some of the words down there for, for you to be able to take a look at it. And you will be able to see uh, places down there in Jerusalem. I'm sure that, you know, of course, in the days of the Apostle Paul, uh, he wouldn't have seen all these things. You know? And Jerusalem of his time uh, was, was really different. But just to highlight uh, the city of David on the left there. You can see yeah. this picture here? Yeah. This is the city of David here. And with the city of David down there, you can see all the ruins here, isn't it? Most probably in the days of the Apostle Paul, he would have come across all this in built up area, beautiful area and so forth. There wasn't any of this place called the Al-Aqsa Mosque, nothing at, at all. Nothing of the Dome of the Rock, nothing at all. Nothing so-called Temple Mount. This place was all, uh, you know, uh, under Roman control, right? And there is this particular golden gate that you want to take note of because this, this particular gate is a, is a very important gate because they believe that, that the Messiah will come back down here and Messiah will come on the Mount of Olive, walk through this place called the Kidron Valley and then come into the golden gate and go into... This particular place, the, the Dome of the Rock down here, is a, is a site in which Abraham sacrificed his son, Isaac. Supposed to sacrifice his son, Isaac. That would be the, the, the temple itself that Solomon built in, in this particular site here. So when uh, Paul, in the days of Jerusalem, in, in, the, in, in his time, when, when we look at Jerusalem today, today we, we definitely do not see... Uh, what Paul would have seen. What you're seeing today is the modern Jerusalem that is uh, seen here. Now, let's go into this uh, next study here. And I'm going to move the slides here. Paul hated the followers of Jesus and he participated in the execution of Stephen, a man full of the Holy Spirit. How the world hated the Christians. I don't know in, in your in your world today that you are living, you know, in the part of the world that you are living today. How are you treated as a Christian today? I think for us in Singapore, we can say that we are comfortable, you know. We we don't have problems and, and so forth. We try to live together with, with other religion and so forth. But I don't know how about uh, people, you know, in Myanmar, in the in, in India, in the Philippines, you know, in Nepal and so forth and New Zealand and that kind of things. Uh, how the world uh, hated Christians. And I don't know whether you are facing that also today because Paul hated the followers of Jesus Christ and he really wanted to execute them and he wanted to condemn them in, you know, in, 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 as, in as many of them as possible. And therefore you have a man by the name of Stephen, one of the seven deacons 
and Paul was there when Stephen was stoned, right? We see that in the book of Acts chapter 6, and Stephen was stoned down there, one of the seven deacons that is seen in scriptures. Paul was determined to murder all who follow Jesus, not just in Jerusalem. You saw the picture of Jerusalem already, but elsewhere from Acts chapter 7 all the way down to Acts chapter 8. And so from AD 30 to 35, he and other Jewish authorities persecuted followers of Jesus in Jerusalem and the surrounding community. And going into the book of Acts chapter 8, you will be able to see the scriptures telling us this account. Just let me just uh, quickly look at this account here for, for us. And so it is stated down here in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, Saul approved of his execution. That's the execution of Stephen. And there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And so people buried Stephen and so forth. And lots of persecution. It was a terrible time for the people. All right. Well, who was a Pharisee? We already mentioned those things earlier. And so you want to see, uh, you want to take note of that also. Huh? I have already done that about who these Pharisees would be. Group of Jewish uh, religious leaders who believe a person must keep every one of the traditions of Judaism as well as the biblical commandments. Now, how many of you have tried eating uh, the pomegranate? I'm sure you have tried, isn't it, the pomegranate? You know, when we, are in, when we were in Israel and whenever I go to Israel, I would love to drink the pomegranate juice. It's tremendous, you know, the juice. Wonderful. If you have opportunity, go there, take the juice. You know, it's, it's, it's squashed out there and squeezed for you and that kind of thing. It's just wonderful. The, the pomegranate, if you cut it open and count the seeds inside, they say that there is at least about 500 seeds inside the pomegranate. And the, the law of the Pharisees would be about 500 of them or so. That is found in the pomegranate. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, we have been told that often when we go to Israel and do our study tours. And it's always told to us about these things. But I'm not interested about the seeds. <laughs> I'm interested in the juice, the pomegranate juice. But it is really important for all of us to take note that these people were people who were really traditionalists. And these were the people who really kept to the laws and so forth. They're very strict. The Pharisees were respected, but very legalistic. That's the Pharisees. Well, let's be very careful about ourselves uh, in our Christian faith. Uh, if you are a leader of the church, be very careful. <laughs> you, don't, you don't become a Pharisee yourself <laughs> with lots of legal laws that, that you put for your people, right? Take a look at this. Jesus condemned them for being self-righteous and hypocritical. Well, you can see that in Matthew 23. Pharisees have plotted to kill Jesus because of his popularity and claim to be gone. Yeah, that's true. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 4. You can look at it there. But I'm just very interested to find out how Paul became a Christian. This is the part that I'm most, most interested in down here. You can see the picture that I show you, the arrow that goes here. Can you see? The map there and the arrow, right? Paul asked the chief priest in Jerusalem to give him authorization to arrest any follower of Jesus in Damascus, 60 kilometers or more away from Jerusalem. Take a look again at this picture here. He travels all the way from Jerusalem. He haven't even reached Damascus, heaven. And he already found the Lord Jesus Christ there. And so I just want to tackle this point here in Acts chapter 9, and if you can take note of it in Acts chapter 9, and you will be able to see that there was an intense hatred for the Christians. He will go anywhere 
to find these people, arrest them, and bring them back to Jerusalem and persecute them and put them in jail, threatening to slaughter these people. And that was the way in which Paul uh, went about to do that to the Christians. That's why I, I, I asked the question just now. Have you, you know, you have been, you, you, you live in a country that may face this kind of problems. Not for us in Singapore. I don't know about your country. You may be having this kind of pe uh, people who are really going after you, finding faults with you and trying to destroy your Christian faith, trying to destroy your church also. This is not surprising because when you look into the scriptures, you see them in the account in the book of Acts. Is there. It happens. It will continue to happen, right? And therefore, brethren, all of you must take note. Even for us here in Singapore, we have to be very mindful ourselves also. We say there is peace, there's prosperity, there's comfort here for all of us who are Christians. Who knows what's going to happen to us? Maybe there is a change of government in time to come. Who knows? Nobody knows. Anything can happen. And then we get all this persecution. Who knows if there's one religion that comes up stronger and then they want to take over the power in the nation. Well, beloved, take note down here. Paul asked the chief priests. Who were the chief priests down here? Go to the book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 6 and in Acts chapter 9 and verse 14 and you will be able to find Annas and Caiaphas. They were the chief priests at the time. And they were the ones who gave that authority to Paul to do that, right? Let me read for you here in verse 14, right? Verse 14 says, and here he has the authority from the chief priest, in the plural, uh, the chief priest, to bind all who call on your name. Then I will read for you in Acts chapter 4 and verse 6, and you have the names of these people. Acts chapter 4 and verse 6, with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. The list is mentioned down here for us. And so we see the high priest giving that permission, that authorization for him to go forth and to arrest as many of the followers of Jesus. Notice the word followers of Jesus. The word followers of Jesus actually have the word uh, let me let me go into the book of uh, Acts again, huh? and I will see if I can get this. Yeah, Acts chapter nine and verse two. Acts chapter nine and verse two says he went to ask him for letters to the synagogue at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, all right, man or woman, he might bring uh, them bound to Jerusalem. The, the Christians were called the way. They were the people who were followers of Jesus. They were known as the way, verse 2. So he was going all the way to, he was going all the, all, all the, the way as, as far as possible into Damascus to get these people. And he was getting to get these people who were called the way, all right? The disciples of Jesus. That, that's interesting, isn't it? Look at Damascus. Damascus today is full of Muslims, right? Damascus today is Islamic. In the days of the Apostle Paul, lots of Christians, lots of believers. Where did the believers come from? Pentecost must have the, caused these people to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And the gospel had been brought to these people in Damascus. And you can imagine lots of Christians in Damascus. And you will be able to see these people who stood up for the Lord Jesus Christ. But today, it is sad, isn't it? When you think of Damascus, it is no more a Christian, or no more having many, many Christians in that part of the world today. Right? Let's move on, shall we? On his way from Judea, to Damascus, 
a light from heaven blinded him. Well, this is a familiar account for all of us. Fell to the ground and a voice said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? This is the account that is found in the book of Acts chapter 9 and in verses 3 and 4. I read for you here in verses 3 and 4 of Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? He heard that voice speaking to him, calling him by name also. So on the way down there, he saw the light and then he was blinded by that light. And let me just mention some things down here because there are some people who say that, you know, Paul had a, a not a spiritual experience, lah. It is something psychological. Uh, he actually didn't see any lights at all. He's just thinking of it, you know. He just, his, his mind wasn't clear at that time, you know. His mind is just full of concentration to try and uh, go and, and persecute the Christians. And therefore, his mind is just crowded with those things. Well, take note of it down here. Some people said it is actually epileptic seizure or a sun stroke. And so he, he imagined he saw the Lord. And so he imagined hearing the voice also. Mental breakdown. That's another group of people who will say that. Stress of his fanatical persecution of the church. And therefore, he acted that way when he heard the voice and so forth. Another theory is that there is the mood change. Because the Christians were an influence to him, therefore, there is the mood change in him. Really? Did all these things really happen to him? Mood change, mental breakdown, epileptic seizure? Well, there is a famous Christian by the name of James Dunn. Take note of his name, James Dunn. James Dunn has written quite a lot of books you know, in the evangelical world, in the Christian world. D-U-N-N, -N, James Dunn. James Dunn said this, It is all in the mind only. Can you believe it? It is all in the mind only, not a reality that Paul went through. Wow. Here is a man who is a theologian, you know, James Dunn, who know the scriptures and understand the scriptures. And yet he could say such a thing like this. Paul actually never had a real experience at all. So on his way from Judah, Judea, to Damascus, and this light from heaven blinded him and so forth. It's really nothing at all. It is all actually in his mind. But the account is so clear because the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 9 that Jesus appeared to the Apostle Paul down here. Saul, he appeared to Saul. And he fell to the ground, the Bible says, and a voice, he heard that voice as a Christian, huh? I've been a Christian for so many years in my life. And I can tell you, this is not a charismatic experience for me. I've heard the voice of the Lord speaking to me himself. In my own, in my, I mean, in, in, in ways that I can understand myself. Twice I experienced that in my life. But, and I tell you, when I, when I, when I experienced that, it speaks of, I mean, I, I've got a tremendous peace that God put in my heart when I experienced that. I don't know how, what Paul went through when he heard the voice of the Lord speaking to him. And the Bible tells us that the voice spoken to him was a clear voice, clear words that God spoke to him. And God also spoke to him. This is a personal reference to him. Two times is mentioned, Saul, Saul is emphatic. We all know from scriptures. If there is the reputation, it is emphatic. Paul or Saul, Saul. And then he asked the question, why do you persecute me? All right. And this is the thing that Jesus identified himself with the disciples. 
This is in John uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 4. Why are you persecuting me? Remember, he was persecuting the Christians, didn't he? And Jesus identified himself with the Christians. When you hurt the body of Christ, you hurt the Lord Jesus Christ. Take note of it, huh? as a Christian ourselves here, don't hurt the body of Christ. Don't break the body of Christ, the unity of the body of Christ and so forth. If you do that, you're going to hurt the Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus identified himself with every one of us, the believers, right? He's, 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 uh, as you see down here in verse 4. Now, there is a question that I thought I should ask you, you know. What language huh, did the Lord spoke to Paul at that time? Have you thought of that or not? What language did you think uh, the Lord spoke to him at that point of time? Maybe you can answer it quietly in, in yourself down here, but I'll give you the answer now. All right? Acts chapter 26 and verse 14. Acts 26 and verse 14 is the answer. And when we all, and when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language. <laughs> See that? In the Hebrew language. God spoke to him in the Hebrew language. Wow. That was the language Paul understood. Paul would have understood other languages also, I'm sure. But that was the language that God spoke to him. Right? Let's move on down here. And Paul answered, Who are you? And the voice says, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. You see that? He identifies himself with the church. And he says, Get up. Go into the city. What city is he talking about? He's talking about Damascus. You haven't reached Damascus, but you got to go into the city. You have to go into Damascus and you will be told what to do. Wow, that's amazing. That's interesting. Acts chapter 9 from verses 5 to 6 is mentioned here. That's the account that is mentioned here. And wait, uh, let me get into Acts chapter 9 and verse 5. Okay. And then we see in verse 5. Uh, verse 5, he asked the question, Who are you, Lord? And, and, he, and here we see the Bible mentions, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting. Yes, I'm Jesus and you are persecuting me. You are persecuting all the Christians and that includes me. All right. Uh, <clears throat> let me also mention here that Paul was actually confused at first. That's why he asked the question, who are you? I'm not sure. And, you know, when he heard the voice. And then the voice mentioned and he identified himself as the Lord. And then he's supposed to go into the city of Damascus. Okay. Uh, let's move on, shall we? Paul was told to go to the house and wait for a believer by the name of Ananias. This is another interesting guy that comes into the life of the Apostle Paul. Before the conversion of Paul, of course, we have Ananias coming into his life. After the conversion of Paul, who was the other guy that came into his life? Barnabas that came into his life. And so I see this uh, as, as people whom God bring into the, our lives in a matter of conversion. There are people who will, whom the Lord has uh, used to bring me to Christ. There are people whom the Lord will bring to build me in my faith. And there are people who will bring me to continue to walk in my Christian life and be used of the Lord for the furtherance of his kingdom. And so there are people whom God will use in our lives, in our Christian life. So you take note of these people in your life, all right? I, I, I have people I know, as I look back in my life, how this person has been a source in which God used this person to bring me to Christ and so forth. Other people who have strengthened me in my faith and so forth. So you want to take note of that. Huh? 
And there you have people who will come into the life of all of us. Now, here was this person by the name of Ananias. Just mention something about this man, Ananias. Ananias, his name was called Ananias of Damascus. Interesting. Look into Damascus itself and you will find Christians there, believers. And you have one of them by the name of Ananias. He lives in Damascus. And this is found in the book of Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. Okay. Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. There was a disciple at Damascus. Specifically, the Bible mentions about his status. He was a Christian. He was a disciple. All right. Every Christian is a disciple. A disciple is a Christian. He has the distinction of being Paul's first Christian friend and assistant. Amazing. I, I think uh, uh, after this, you don't hear of, of Ananias anymore. No? The thing is, when we go up to heaven, uh, it would be wonderful to be able to meet Ananias. You know? I mean, I, I would love to meet him in heaven and ask him, Ananias, how was that feeling you know, to meet Paul? And Elias will, will say, as I read in the scriptures, I was so frightened to meet him. <laughs> I was so frightened to meet him. You know, here was the terror of the Christian faith. <laughs> here was the one who tried to kill the Christians and he must be a terror. And I was so frightened to meet him. But God used him, right? We hear him only in the connection with one crucial event in Paul's life. That's, that's all. So I, I want you to take note, now, this is the, the thing about our lives. Sometimes God uses us in one situation in our Christian life. And that's all. No more. So let's, let's take note now, then, that God may not use us in so many aspects of our Christian life. All right, He uses us in one area and that's all he uses us. And that's all. Finish. Praise the Lord for that. And I'm sure Ananias would have been so happy that the Lord used him in this aspect of helping the Apostle Paul. His identity, Ananias, means Jehovah has been gracious. Luke introduced him as a certain disciple at Damascus in Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. A certain disciple at Damascus. Beautiful. I you know when I read this thing, it just touches my heart. Here was a man who was really committed to the Lord. He was not one of the Christians who you know, uh, escape the persecution of the, of, of, uh, uh, of the Christians in Jerusalem. He lived there. He heard from many about Saul. He heard something about this man. Of course, many things about this man, his activities and so forth. He did not experience anything from Saul yet. Right? And he was truly used of the Lord. Tradition make him to be one of the 70s, you know. That's the tradition only la. in uh, Luke chapter 10 and verse 1. Notice also one thing. Eh? There is no record of him holding any position among the believers at Damascus. Was he a bishop? No. Was he a pastor? No. Was he somebody, a, a, a deacon in the, in the church or, or an or a elder in the church? No. The Bible just mentioned down here, a certain disciple. That's all. Right? And so, we look at ourselves this evening. We must be that certain disciple God can use. God would use. So, don't, don't look at ourselves and say, I must be somebody, you know, I must be a, 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 a this person. I mean, I must be that person of authority. And uh, Of course, if God makes you to be a person of authority, praise the Lord for that. But, you, you must be that certain disciple that God can use and will use. And so, I want to give you this verse here because this is what Paul described him. And you want to take note of this verse because in Acts chapter 22 and verse 12, Paul have this description of this man. Acts 22 and verse 12 says, And one Ananias, what was he like? A devout man according to the law. One. Two. Well spoken of by all the Jews who live there. Fantastic. 
This man is a devout Jew. This man was a devoted man, committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was given solely to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he was a tremendous example of the believers also. A certain disciple. So you take note of that, you know. We are all certain disciples. If we are all certain disciples, let's be people who are devoted to the Lord. Let's be people who, whom we can shy forth for the Lord Jesus Christ always. All right? So this is the thing that we need to do for all of us in our Christian life. Let's move on, shall we? And see the next thing here. Right? There you see the map down here. It goes all the way to Damascus. What did other believers uh, think? Well, the Lord spoke to Ananias and Ananias was afraid. That's true. He knew Paul's reputation but went to the house in spite of his fear. And the Lord says that Paul was chosen to take the Lord's name to Gentiles, to their kings and to the Jews. Wow, that's amazing. This man was used of the Lord. Now, first thing first, Ananias was fearful. And the Lord spoke to him. You see, this man was close to God. And we, we always want to take note of this certain disciple, devout man of God. And the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord used him. And he was afraid. Who wasn't afraid when you want to listen? And when, when you listen to the, to the name of Paul, wow, he was a great persecutor of the Christian. He knew Paul's reputation. Just the mere mention of the name Paul or Saul, Saul, sends terror in the heart of this man, right? Just the mere mention of the name. But he went to the house in spite of the fear, right? And this is found in the book of Acts chapter 9 and verse uh, 13. I read for you here in Acts chapter 9 and verse 13. And Ananias says, Lord, I've heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. Verse 14, and here he has authority from the chief priest to buy all who call on your name. See that? He has all the authority to do that. All this fellow must have been frightened, right? And he was just so fearful. And then what happens is that in verse 15, we read down here, the Lord said unto Paul that he was chosen to take the Lord's name to the Gentiles and to their kings. I read for you verse 15. Huh? Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings. The kings are plural, okay? And the children of Israel. Who are the kings or who were the kings that Paul went to share the gospel with? I mentioned their names, okay? Maybe perhaps you will know them. Agrippa. Festus, Caesar, he went to share the gospel with them. Look at verse 15 again. Go, that one word, that's all. Ananias, go, that's all. I want you to do that. And Ananias went to do the work of God. I just want to ask us, you know, when we do studies like this, huh, sometimes it becomes very theoretical for us when we look at it all, you know. But we, we have to apply these style of lessons for our lives and ask ourselves down here, if the Lord asks us to go, are we willing to do that? Sometimes it's difficult, you know. Uh, I, I, Reverend Goh asked me to go to Nepal also. <laughs> And I told him, I say, yeah, yeah, I, I don't mind going to Nepal, but I have this problem with me. I have this thing called thalassemia, you know. Thalassemia has a reference to my, uh, my health. And then high altitude, I will have a problem with breathing. High altitude. 
And Nepal is one place that is very high up also. And therefore, I never want to go to this place. Uh, I've been to high places before and I know that I really had some problems <laughs> with myself. So, thank God I had the privilege to share with you <laughs> from, from Zoom here, <laughs> you know, and not having to go all the way to Nepal <laughs> to share with you. Uh, so, the word is go. Yes, the thing is, am I willing to go, <laughs> you know? And when the Lord first asked me to go into uh, Operation Mobilization, going back all the way to 1974, I was thinking, my Lord, you know, I, I, I'm, I have to leave my job. You know, I was working in the shipyard and I was, uh, I was working as a quality controller in the shipyard and enjoying my job and so forth. And here is the calling from the Lord to go. Lord, are you sure you want me to go? <laughs> you know, but... I, I say, Lord, if you want me, I'll go. I told my father about it, you know. And the amazing thing is my father says, you go as the Lord tells you to go. He's a Christian and he supported me all the way too. And I went. And I went to do the work of the ministry in missions. So praise the Lord for that. So that word is a very significant word. Ananias, go. Did Ananias question God after that? No. <laughs> He just said, Lord, I heard a lot of things about this man, you know. I just heard a lot of things about this man. In other words, Lord, I'm frightened. Who is not frightened? If the Lord asks us to go, who is not frightened? Beloved, we are all frightened, you know. To go and do mission work is a frightening thing. To go and do, you know, other ministries is, is a frightening thing for us. But God gave us the grace to do this work for him. So I want to encourage us, let's do the work for him and let's go and serve the Lord when he tells us to go. And Ananias placed his hand on Paul and Paul's sight was restored. Acts chapter 9 and verse 17. And then he was filled with the Holy Spirit. Wow, this man is it's amazing. I read for you in Acts chapter 9 verse 17. So Ananias departed and he entered the house and laying his hands on, on him, he uses this word, you know, very significant word. When you read the Bible, you take note of this kind of words. He called Saul, brother Saul. He straight away identified him as my, as my brother. Why? Because God has already, Jesus has already spoken to him. See that? And he straight away identified Paul as a fellow brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amazing. Brother Saul. Wow. Accepted Saul as a fellow believer straight away. Well, I just want to ask us also to be mindful about this teaching from God's word because there are people who will come to Christ from a background that is so wicked sometimes. <laughs> All right. Uh, I remember the story of Cory Tamboon, who stood at the entrance of the church one day after she shared a testimony of being in the concentration camp in the Second World War. And after the service, as she stood outside at the entrance of the, the church, as the people were coming out, she saw this big lady who came forward to her and stretched forth her arm to shake her hand. And at that time, Corrie Ten Boon recognized that lady. She was one of the concentration camp guards. And that camp guard was one of those who caused the death of the sister. She was frozen at that moment. She couldn't shake the hands of this lady. But she asked the Lord for the grace to accept this lady. And God gave her the grace to do so. And she put her hand forth to shake that lady's hand. They are both sisters in the Lord. So beloved, we, we look at life today, you know, there are people who will come to Christ. Background different from us. Some are very wicked people who come to Christ, drug addicts and what have you and so forth. Our lives have been changed. Will we accept them as brothers or sisters in Christ? 
will we do that? And this is the thing about churches today, you know, because churches today sometimes do not want to admit people with that kind of background. And that's, that's frightening. That's, that's troubling for me. One day a man called me up in my church and says, Pastor, I want to come to your church. I say, you're welcome. He said, but I want to tell you I'm an HIV, HIV positive. Am I welcome to, to your church, Grace Church? I say, yeah, you're welcome to Grace Church. The first thing you come, you just let me know. I'll be there. I'll welcome you. That's the thing. We have to accept these people whose life has been changed, transformed, revolutionized by God. And this is one example down here. He called this person Saul, brother Saul. God help us to do that. Huh? God help us to do that. And not to be proud people, not to be people who feel with pride and says, I'm a Christian. This guy is, is a tax collector. <laughs> you know, he's a tax collector and I'm, I'm not like him. You know, I'm, and we, we can't do that at all. And then, of course, in verse 18, he was, he was baptized, as the Bible tells us, filled with the Holy Spirit. And God gave him the grace to live for the Lord. Let's move on down here. Paul started uh, to speak in the synagogue. After he came to Christ, he spoke for the Lord. Right? Take a look at all these things here. Started speaking in the synagogue, convincing people that Jesus was the Messiah. People were amazed. People were confused <laughs> because they said, how can this guy be a Christian? <laughs> you know? And then, of course, the believers back in Jerusalem refused to believe he had changed until one of their leaders by the name of Barnabas, here is a man, Barnabas, coming to the picture, vowed for him. See that? In Acts chapter 9, from verses 20 down to 29, you have the account of Paul. I read for you in verse 23 here. 23 mentions that at this point, after, uh, sorry, not, not 23, uh, from verse 20 to 29, he, he started to go into the synagogue. He preaches the word of God and so forth. Uh, of course, the, the Jews were not happy with him. And then, of course, a lot of people were not convinced about his conversion and that kind of things. Now, let me read for you in verse uh, 26 here. Verse 26 of Acts chapter 9. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. And so he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, the Greeks, but they were seeking to kill him. Right? So Paul was converted, and the moment he was converted, he went forth preaching the word of God. Wow, this man is amazing, isn't he, Paul? Full of energy for the Lord, went forth to preach the gospel for the Lord Jesus Christ also. Well, I just wonder if there's any questions from any one of you down here now, at this time, before we go into this account of what the Pharisees think. Any one of you with anything that you're not clear about, I actually have gone a bit fast. <laughs> yeah. Every, everybody is okay, no problem at all, understand and so forth. Okay, right. Let's move on. What did the Pharisees think? Because the Lord has spoken to him, Paul kept preaching in the synagogues in Damascus and saying that Jesus was the Son of God. He continued to do that task. He's a great man, isn't he? Acts chapter 9 and verse 20 tells us so. I read for you down here. Immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue saying he's the Son of God. How in the world did this guy... He's able to do it. His, his life is just transformed and changed. His, his theology and understanding of God is there. It's amazing. And God just used him. And he just went forth to preach the word of God. 
He was so bold to preach the word of God. Then he gave proof from the scriptures to show that Jesus was the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. He did that. This is found in verse 22. Acts chapter 9 verse 22. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who live in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. So he was, after his conversion in Damascus, he stayed in Damascus, he preached in Damascus, he told the people about the Lord Jesus Christ, he went into the synagogue to preach the Lord Jesus Christ and so forth. And then later on, he went to Jerusalem and he was in Jerusalem that he found it difficult to join the disciples. And that was when uh, Barnabas came into the scene and caused him to be joined together with the disciples of the Lord. All right, let's move on to see this next one here. To the Jews, Paul proclaimed about Jesus and they considered Jesus blasphemous, right? Don't talk about Jesus. I, I don't want to listen to, to you about Jesus. And by the way, eh, if you ever speak to a Jew, you just want to be mindful that if you mention the name of Jesus, they'll be offended by you. All right? The, the, Hebrews, the Hebrew word for, for the Lord Jesus is Yeshua. And if you speak about him, just be mindful. They'll come after you. Even if you are in Israel, when you speak to the Jews about Jesus, be mindful that they will not be happy about what you, you are talking about uh, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In Singapore, we have a Jewish community. And I remember many years ago when I brought a group of my church people, uh, Gracians, to visit the Jewish synagogue. And when we went into the synagogue to see the way in which they worship and so forth, there was this tour guide. And this tour guide, of course, was uh, a Jewish tour guide because he's going to bring us around the synagogue in Waterloo Street. Now, those of you Singaporeans will know Waterloo Street, the, the place in which uh, the synagogue would be. And what happened was that when, <laughs> when, <laughs> when he knows that I'm a Christian and I'm the pastor, you know, who is leading this group, he was very frank with me. He told me in the face... <laughs> He says, and this is many years ago. <laughs> I say it's many years ago because if he, if he were to say it today, he would have got himself into trouble. He said that you Christians believe in a God who is a thief and a robber. <laughs> he said that. He says, Jesus is not a good man. He's a bad man. He's a thief and a robber. I mean, if he were to say that to me today, he would have gotten himself into trouble with the law, present law that has to do with uh, racial harmony and what have you, uh, religious harmony. So there are people, the Jews especially, would be doing things like that and they would just consider it blasphemous. If you talk about the name of Jesus, it's not right. The Jews were outraged and they plotted to kill Paul as he walked out of the city gates. Well, you can see that in uh, verses 23 to 25. And I'll just read for you here in verses 23 to 25. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. And they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket and he escaped these people there were fanatics and there were you know, all these people who were out to destroy the christians i don't know whether you 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 face this type of people you know i i tell you my experience when i was in india we going back all the way when i was only very young i was only about 24 years old you know, when i was with operation mobilization in india in 1974 1975 and I was doing evangelistic work with all my Indian brethren. 
and we were doing uh, uh, giving out the gospel tracts and so forth. And all of a sudden, we were surrounded by by all these young people, you know, and they they all have their hair all shaved type, you know, all their hair shaved completely, and with a little ponytail at the back only, you know, at the back of their head. And they ran up to to all of us, and they just surrounded us. And my Indian brothers were telling me, he says, brother, don't worry about these things. Uh, he says, you, you follow me, you follow me quickly. And he guided me, my, my fellow OMA boy, uh, friend, brother in the Lord, you know, escorted me, walked with me out of that, that scene. And they were actually came, they came very near to us. They pulled away our gospel tracks and what have you. And they were about to, to do something bad to all of us. But this guy was very fast in their re reaction, this Operation Mobilization people. And they just brought all of us, these foreigners, out of this, the, the, that situation. They are fanatics, you know, who is all out to want to destroy us and kill us. Another one uh, that I remember when we were in the Philippines, you know, and I was in the... Uh, in Iligan City, you know, if you are a Filipino down here, you would know I was in the Iligan City and we were preaching the gospel in an open air. And I remember very well some of these people telling me, say that when you preach, not only in the Philippines, but also there's another incident in, in India. When you preach, just make sure you look carefully at the crowd when you preach. I say, why? Of course, when I preach, I look at the crowd. Lah. You see, you look carefully at the crowd, all right? Because uh, sometimes the stones will be coming at you, you know. They'll be throwing things at you. And you're going to be hurt. So, beloved, there are people like that who are there to try and hurt you. But when I was in Kenya to preach, and Reverend Alex is here with us, we had a very good time preaching the Word of God. <laughs> we had an open-air preaching, and it was wonderful because nobody actually gave us trouble at all. We had an open air preaching. Well, the Jews were out to kill him. And then Paul learned of the plot and his friends put him in the basket and he went off. He was able to escape. Let's, let me just move on to the next one down here. Life as a fugitive for Paul. See that arrow down there? One more time. Huh? Life as a fugitive for Paul. <laughs> That's the Arabian desert there in the map. Paul spent three years in Arabia. After he came to Christ, he preaches in Damascus. After he preaches in Damascus, he came to Jerusalem. And then, of course, you know, in between that time, he actually spent some time in Arabia. In fact, before he came to Jerusalem, after he preaches in Damascus, he spent three years of his life in the Arabian desert. And he was there to be close to God in his walk with God. I want you to see with me this verse here. I'm going to the book of Galatians now. Galatians chapter 1 and show you this verse here. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 7. Okay, let me let me get the text. Uh, sorry, one and verse seventeen. Right, one and verse seventeen. Now did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. All right, that was what happened to him. He spent three years of his life in Arabia. Let me go back to the book of uh, Acts chapter 9. If I can show you from Acts chapter 9 and verse 22. <clears throat> All right. Uh, let me see. Uh, Acts chapter 9. Acts and verse 23. Right. Many days Look at verse 23 of Acts chapter 9. And when many days had passed, stop down there, pause there. Many days had passed, and the, the commentators mentioned that the, 
after many days is as reference to Paul spending the time in Arabia. And then after that, he went to Jerusalem and then the, the plot was there to try to kill him and so forth. And so when Paul was in Arabia, he spent the time meditating. He spent the time with the Lord and he was able to get, uh, you know, inspiration from the Lord. I believe that when he was in Arabia, he also had this experience. I'm going to show you from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. Right? Until verse 10. He had this experience when he was in Arabia. I, I read for you here. Of course, the text don't mention about Arabia. I must go on. I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelation of the Lord. I know a man about 14 years ago. Caught up to the third heaven. 14 years ago. Going back all the way. To the time when he was converted. And when he was in Arabia. And so he says that. In that time. Somehow, he was taken up to the third heaven. He had that experience. And that was where the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord encouraged him and so forth. So here was a man who had that experience, that personal experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Today, we, we, we don't seek for that kind of experience. Lah. Today, we can be closer to God in our walk with him, reading the word of God in spending a prayer with the Lord and so forth. We don't look for that kind of experience going up to heaven and so forth, right? And we can just spend the time with him to seek after him. And that's what we should be doing for all of us in our Christian life, all right? That's in Arabia. And then, of course, later on, Damascus, he went back to Damascus. Paul then went to preach to Jerusalem, boldly preach in the synagogue. There you see from Damascus, you see the, the, the map. Huh? I, I'm going to show you the line. There he came back to Jerusalem. From Damascus, he came back to Jerusalem. After the time that he spent in Arabia, he went back to Damascus and then he came to Jerusalem and then he preached in the synagogue there. And he tried to convince the people about Jesus. He preached fearlessly and debated at every opportunity. Fantastic, this man. He was, he was doing all sorts of things for the Lord Jesus Christ. He was debating with the Hellenistic uh, Grecian Jews. And so it only tells me one thing, you know. He doesn't only speak Hebrew. He also speaks, he spoke Greek also, and he was he was just very fluent in in, uh, in in those languages, right? Now I wonder how many of you study Greek. You know, <laughs> I I did my exegesis in Greek also, and one of the things that I notice uh, when I do an exegesis and translation of the Greek text especially in the book of 1st John, 2nd John and 3rd John. I don't have a problem in translating uh, from English to Greek or Greek to English. Not too much of a problem. But when I do a translation on Romans to Greek and Greek to Romans, I have a lot of problems. Simply because it was written by Paul. The other one was written by the fisherman, isn't it? John the Apostle. Uh, you have somebody who is very well educated, who is able to write words that is deeper in that understanding. And so here is an example of Paul. Paul was very fluent in his Greek language. He knew what he was speaking about. He was also fluent in his Hebrew also. So it teaches us one thing, uh, that we all as Christians need to be very 
uh, uh, well versed in in some of the things that we have learned in our in our colleges and so forth. You know, sometimes we forget. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, I speak for myself also. I've not used Greek for a long time. I mean, <laughs> exegesis and so forth. But I think we need to continue to remember uh, those things that we have uh, gone through in our, in our theological studies. Let's move on, shall we? Paul received death threats and the believers brought him out of Jerusalem to this place called Caesarea. Caesarea. He went back home to Tarsus later on. Now, this is where I want to show you one other picture here of Caesarea. Yeah. This is a picture of Caesarea. This is a picture of Caesarea in, in, uh, in Israel. And it is by the sea. And if you go to Israel, you must go to this place, Caesarea. And Herod, the one... The King Herod was the one who built a fantastic seaport here in Caesarea. And here you will be able to see the uh, amphitheater, isn't it? This is not a very big amphitheater. In, a, in the teaching that I will share with you later on, when Paul was uh, in his missionary journey, I will show you the amphitheater in Ephesus that sits 25,000. This one is not even 25,000 that can sit here. But these are all new amphitheater that is sort of make up. Huh? But the old one is all, they, they make it, they do a uh, you know, repair job on them and so forth. And so here was the picture. Uh, here is the picture of, of Caesarea in which Paul was in this place. This, this place was fully developed in the days of Herod. And by the sea itself down here, this part of the sea itself here. In fact, if you can go into uh, your search engine to look for Caesarea, you'll be able to see that the seaport itself was all down here. And Herod built a tremendous seaport here. And it was later on that Paul was in Caesarea for two years or so, in prison here. And then his final journey from Caesarea, he went to Rome. Remember, that is the journey to Rome, where he finally ended up in Rome. And then he was, uh, you know, later on, they, they executed him or what. I'm not sure. But that's the account here. But that's, that's Caesarea. You want to take note of here. Paul received death threats. And then, of course, we see him uh, brought out of Jerusalem to Caesarea. There you can see the picture here. If I can show you, there you see the picture. I <laughs> you see the arrow there. Later on, he went back to Tarsus. He was from Jerusalem and he went all the way back to Tarsus in Turkey. That's a very long journey to travel you know, on foot uh, with horses and what have you and so forth. And so Paul went all the way back uh, that time. So, Paul in Tarsus, and you got to go into the book of Acts chapter 11 from verses 25 to 26. And we will be able to see some things down there. And let me just go into that account for you in Acts chapter 11 and verse 25. Let me get this account here. Huh? Yeah. So he was, he was uh, in Tarsus, and later on when he was in Tarsus, um, there was none other than Barnabas who went to search for him. And Barnabas went to search for him because they, they wanted him to come and do the ministry in Antioch. And then they went back to Jerusalem later on. Okay, so we want to take note of that. So he went back all the way to Tarsus and he was down there for a period of time. Uh, this was a time in which he would have gone back and after having faced all these problems in his life, he, he went back home and most probably he would have been back home to reflect upon the things that has happened in his life. 
And that is found in the book of Acts chapter 9 and verse 28 to, uh, to 30. Let me, let me go to Acts chapter 9 and verse 28, shall we? Shall we just take a look at it down here? Uh, Acts chapter 9 and verse 20. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and he disputed with the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And so when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea. And then from Caesarea, they brought him all the way to Tarsus. He went back all the way to Tarsus. All right. Now let's, let's move on, shall we? Is Jesus only for the Jews? Well, during the early years of Christianity, most of the believers were Jewish. And Jesus' disciples preached only to the Jews. And yet as Jewish people scattered throughout the Roman Empire, they told their neighbors about Jesus. Well, there was persecution, and persecution is one of the means in which uh, people have to move out from their comfort zone uh, to be able to preach the gospel. And so they went forth to preach the gospel. I'm going to go forth to this part down here in telling you that Barnabas finally found Paul. See, he went all the way to Tarsus, and with Paul, he preached to the non-Jews, and Barnabas took Paul to Syrian Antioch, uh, where they minister for a year. See the map down here again? See the picture of this movement? From Tarsus, he went down to Antioch. And then at the city of Antioch, the believers were called Christians. That's amazing. I like this particular verse here, especially in verse uh, in Acts chapter 11. And it has always been an encouragement for me to share this verse with people. Uh, verse 25 says, Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. I just want to make these things clear. There has been teaching in, in the Christian church that a disciple, a Christian cannot be a disciple of Christ if he doesn't go through some sort of discipleship training. Is that true? Cannot be, man. I, I, I can't accept that. The Bible tells us very clearly down here that in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. We're not talking about the 12 disciples, you know. We're talking about all the, the disciples of Christ, of Christ. The disciples were called Christians. So this kind of teaching that says, hey, you must go through a discipleship course, you know. If you don't go through a discipleship course, you cannot be a Christian. No. Every Christian is a disciple and every disciple is a Christian. So I think every one of us should be very clear about this matter here. And then we note there in the account that he went to Jerusalem because there was a famine that hit Jerusalem and the Christians wanted relief. The Bible tells us they sent Paul and Barnabas with the gifts there in Acts chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. There you can see the map again, isn't it? Going back from Antioch, they went all the way back to Jerusalem with the gifts that they gave to the people. All right? And when their mission was accomplished, well, look at the last part down here. When the mission was accomplished, Barnabas and Paul, along with a young man by the name of Mark, headed back north to start a missionary journey throughout Asia. They went back again. Back and forth, back and forth, these people went. It's amazing, isn't it? Back and forth, back and forth, they went. And they did the work for the ministry. The next week when we come back again, we will do the first missionary journey of Paul. But I'm just going to read for you Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. Down here. 
I read for you Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene. This particular place, Cyrene, is Libya. No? Libya. By the end, a longtime friend of Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. And so being filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus and so forth. Well, actually I, I love to go to see the uh, places in which Paul went. And I hope that in that I will be able to do that to visit a place like Cyprus, uh, you know, Crete and so forth, to see where Paul went in his missionary journey. Uh, my wife was the one who said to me always, "No need to go lah. You this type of things, <laughs> you you can see it in a in a in, in the internet already." <laughs> but I think to to go down there is just wonderful to be able to see the places in which the apostle would have been. Like I've been to Israel and being at the place itself makes makes a difference altogether. Well, we stop here. If there's anything that you may want to ask, we can we can just ask. We are at uh, almost 9.20 already. <laughs>